Yes, welcome to the Biz Communications Show. I'm your host, Bill Lampton. Every week, bringing you a business communication expert because talking with them and hearing their ideas, their tips, and their strategies will help us improve our sales, our marketing, our teamwork, our customer service, our image, and yes, our profits. Today, we have with us Bob Littell. Bob is a longtime proponent of what, in fact, he's the creator of what's known as net weaving. Bob says that net weaving is the business application of the pay it forward theory. Uh, I, I first came in contact with Bob because he was well known for this and someone suggested that I get to know him. Bob wrote a book about net weaving. He's a popular speaker on that topic and on other topics as well. In addition to that, Bob has enjoyed a very profitable, prosperous, and helpful career in the insurance industry. So delighted to welcome with us today, Bob Littell, the chief net weaver. And by the way, that is his email, Chief Netweaver. Hello, Bob. Hey, Bill. It's just great to be on again, and thanks for having me back. Uh, evidently, I said something that was of interest. You always do, my friend. And one of the things that your major interest, something else that you're known for, is not only writing books, but you are an incredible, avid, tireless reader of books. <laughs> and so, I have asked you for our conversation today to select two books about business communication that you feel our viewers and our podcast listeners will benefit from reading. And we have only 20 minutes, so we have to go quickly with this, but we can discuss them briefly. First of all, let's think about the book, Crucial Conversations. What is it, Bob, that the authors categorize as crucial conversations? How do they define that? Well, let me, let me also introduce this by saying, Bill, I chose this book because of a terrible set of conversations that I had at probably the most significant point in my working career where I just absolutely had a uh, parting of the way, uh, parting of the ways with a partner and did such a terrible job of communicating and of keeping my cool in conversations that would start very uh, level and then the volume would pick up. And he just had this wonderful way of, as they say, pressing my button. And once he pressed my button, it was almost all over. And so this book really helps help me, and I think will help anyone who really is involved in what the authors, and the authors are uh, Kerry Patterson, uh, Joseph Grenny, Ron McMillan, and Al Schweitzer, and what they define or characterize as a crucial conversation as one where the opinions vary, in other words, where you and I don't necessarily agree, that's a, that's a given. Uh, secondly, where the stakes are high. This is not we're deciding where to go for dinner tonight, okay? Uh, and the third is where emotions are strong. We're going into the conversation. You know that each of the two persons have a vested interest in, quote, their side of the coin. That sounds, Bob, like a description of the conversation that you mentioned a couple of minutes ago. And it seems to me what you were indicating was, gosh, I wish I'd read this book <laughs> before that pivotal time. Okay, so it, it's a highly charged atmosphere, in other words. And what did they say are some of the secrets to mastering these crucial conversations. Clearly, they wrote the book to give some directions, suggestions, and answers. What are some of those? Well, before, before I say some of those, let me just real quickly say, why is it that, that these 
that the that the people are able to press our buttons a lot of it actually is evolutionary that the flight fight part of our brain uh, once we have once we start going in that direction the part of our brain which is that fight flight start takes over and that deprives our brain of the creative solving part so those who have really mastered this particular um, science of how you really um, uh, master uh, overcoming uh, the tendency to just get into this violent argument is you first have to really understand that it's it's you it's you have your side of the the meaning okay and the other person has their entire different set of meanings. And so the first step that the authors say, which is so important, is to get definitions of what is meaning out on the table. And probably they, they recommend several steps for doing that. One is that you keep asking questions you really are trying to understand what the other person's side of their meaning is, of all the elements in that conversation. And so you keep asking questions. And Bob, what, what, I, can, what I can sense right here yes. is that this is very much against our, our habits and our nature because our habits and our nature are to drive home our point, to persuade, to insist, and not to be open, correct? And it's to get to the bottom line. It's to get to the action. And when we try to get to the action, instead of understanding that what we should be doing is we should be approaching this as a complex problem, and if we can avoid the, once again, the fight flight part of our biological nature and get into the problem solving element, then we can start to understand or to add to what they call the pool, uh, enlarging the pool of, of, of meaning. And they point out that as this pool grows larger and as people uh, really are starting to understand the other, where the other person is coming from, then you can start to get into an action which will hopefully be more of a, quote, win-win. Bob, this reminds me so much of Stephen Covey's seek first to understand and then to be understood. And again, I would point out that that is not our inclination. We want everybody else to understand our point, and then maybe eventually we'll get to theirs, but Covey in that chapter five of his book really was saying pretty much what you have just described. Absolutely. And, and Covey incidentally wrote the, uh, 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 I think it was an introduction to this book as well, because he saw, just as you're pointing out, how similar their thoughts are along those lines. So then once we do the listening, once we get their viewpoint, once we try to understand, as we put it in the vernacular, where they're coming from, what do we do next? Well, first we have to, as they say, start with our heart. What do we really want to happen out of this discussion, out of this meeting, out of this project, whatever it is? we really need to start with the heart. We need to understand our own heart in order to understand the others. And they give really a three-step process that I really like. Number one is you clarify what you really want. You start with the heart, with your own heart. Secondly, you identify what you really don't want to have happen, which is to have this thing just go into a, a just an argument where nobody wins, each of you end up leaving totally upset and mad, and, and, and no action gets done, and, and guess what? Call the attorneys, okay? <laughs> and the third one is to present your brain with a, with the complex problem, so that once again, I keep coming back to this, 
so that we get the brain working on solutions rather than we let the body take over the anger and the natural things that cause us to deprive ourselves of the use of the brain to solve problems. You know, I think that every one of us, when we hear this, we can think back not to just one, but we can think back to many conversations which turned into a battleground when that could have been avoided with this type of approach. And this is why, to me, uh, sometimes people decry soft skills. They say it's a waste of time. We, in our high tech age, no, we, we don't need these soft skills. But if we're going to be a part of a team and if we're going to persuade people and if we're going to sell and if we're going to manage, we need these, don't we? Absolutely, absolutely. Bob, we'll move along now to the other book. And I will mention, as you will at the end, that you're going to give an offer to people where they can get your, your summary, written summary of the book. And knowing you, those are very thorough. Uh, you'll give that offer at the end. So stand by. The next book is The Challenger Sale. And this one talks about our traditional ways of selling and which in many ways are still the current ways with most sales representatives, but they give a different approach here. What is the traditional way, Bob, and what is the way that's proposed in the challenger sale? Well, the, the first part of this is understanding that when I first read this book, I really got concerned because one of the key elements of this book is dividing sales, represent sales reps into five different categories, which are supported by extensive, extensive, extensive research. Uh, at the time the book was written, over 6,000 individuals, uh, 90 companies, and they've continued to do research along those lines. So this is based on extensive research. And of the five personality types, behavioral styles, these are the hard worker, the challenger, the relationship builder, the lone wolf, and the reactive problem solver. Now, real quickly, just a couple of words about each. We all know that hard worker is the one that gets in at the beginning of the day, um, is constantly working but not necessarily working on the A's, working on the B's and C's and, and patting themselves on the back at the end of the day for having organized all their sales calls, but never having made any. Okay. And, and think they're, they're thinking that being busy means you're productive. Exactly, exactly. The, uh, the, I'll leave the challenger until last. The lone wolf. And this is an interesting group. These are the guys that if you're managing salesmen, you don't like them very much. They are the ones that are the pain in the you know what, but somehow they almost always end up at the top for sales production. They're difficult to deal with. They're opinionated, but they're very, very action oriented. These are the mavericks. The mavericks, that's a great word for it. The other one are reactive problem solvers and they are effective in some ways, but the problem is they are so customer focused that they're all ready to make a sales call and an existing customer calls up with a problem. And they are so attuned to serving the client that all of a sudden, zap, they're 180 degrees in the opposite direction to solve that problem first before they ever go back. And so their results are just taken down by, believe it or not, this huge desire to solve customers' problems. The fourth one is the one that really worried me, the relationship builder. Because when they now talk about ranking them, 
in who's the most successful and the most effective, guess what? The relationship builder ranked at the very bottom. Now, and you and I would have predicted absolutely it, the opposite it, the of that. The opposite, okay? So let me clarify because it's very important. So the challenger and what sets the challenger apart from just a normal solution provider who knows how to ask questions, knows how to disturb the client, knows how to find problems and does research on the client's problems. The difference really is that the challenger goes the step farther and not only asks the questions, but challenges the client in a way, in a friendly but assertive way, and also provides solutions actually provides the action steps and tells the client what he needs to do. So why is there this reverse between the relationship builder and the challenger? It's because if you're just in today's world as a relationship builder, and this especially happened after the last economic downturn that we had, I love this quote. I love doing business with Bob or, or Jim or Al, but Bill brought me the solution. Bill brings me solutions to my problems. Bob's a great guy. He sends me information on interesting topics, but Bill actually provides me with solutions. Bob, what intrigues me about this is that there's a very successful entrepreneur that I've been dealing with for 20 years. He has demonstrated exactly what you're talking about. He doesn't spend an incredible amount of time asking about your family, your hobbies. Uh, he, he just doesn't fool with that. What he wants to know is what are their problems? And then, immediately, almost immediately, skipping what you and I would call rapport building. He says, well, here's what you need to do. And unless you do it, your situation is not going to improve at all. And he gives a one, two, three, four, five, and you better do that, you know? Yes, yes. Now, you might ask though, the best challenger salespeople have done extensive, we're talking extensive research on that company and their problems. And if, it's, if, you're a, if you're a one person operation, it's lucky in today's world, we have Google, we have LinkedIn, we have all kinds of ways to do research on industries and problems that we never had before. But for individuals in larger companies, the other thing that the challenger sale goes into is those companies need to recognize that the research part of this needs to be done by someone inside that company to free up the time of this person to not only make the sale and to challenge them and to give them solutions, but also the other end of that is, guess what? building trusted relationships. So the, the magic that I got out of the book is, it's not that relationship building is no longer important, it's that you first have to build the trust instead of the old backslapping, take somebody to the football games, play golf with them, that's fine, but it actually would be better if you reverse the process, be a problem solver, a complex problem solver first, and build that relationship on top of that as well, so that you don't end up being the one that they say, well, I play golf with Bob, but Bill, Bill is the guy I do business with because he brings me solutions. This is totally fascinating. And another point I notice here, is that you say the challenger sales reps are strangely enough the ones who create the most customer loyalty. <laughs> it's because they get results, right? It's because they get results. And it just makes so much common sense that, that 
if, if I become a, a value added resource for you, and I might call that an invaluable resource provider for you, the last thing you want to do is to cut ties with me. You want to build the relationships with me because you recognize that it's not only great for you, but it's great for your company. Bob, I said a few minutes ago that would you please now give us your contact information? And uh, you have made the offer that if someone will email you and request your written summary of these books, you will send it to them. That is a tremendous offer. Having seen many of your book summaries, I know that they are thorough and they're insightful. So share with us your contact information, please. Well, Bill, the, the timing of this is really good as well because I'm redoing my entire website and I'm also putting the two books on net weaving that will be up on the website and available for purchase. The, the heart and art of net weaving as well as raising your R&R factor, how referable and recommendable are you? So please, in addition to emailing me at chiefnetweaver at gmail.com, chiefnetweaver is just like it sounds, and I will be glad to send you these two. Now, what Bill didn't mention is that these two books are part of 48 books that I have summarized, all with author's permission, in conjunction with our Don't Need to Read the Book book club, which we have been running for now, I think it's almost eight years. And Bill has been one of our greatest contributors and discussion group, in many cases, communication leaders uh, within those uh, book clubs. So I look forward to hearing from you and uh, hopefully uh, you can visit the website netweavinginternational.com and uh, hope I can be a further help to you in your future. Thank you, Bob, for that offer and your contact information. Thank you for being a tremendously informative and helpful guest on the Biz Communication Show today, both on video and podcast. I want to thank those who have joined us in our video discussion and on our podcast. And since Bob has given his contact information, I'm happy to give mine. Bill Lampton, the biz communication guy. So obviously my website is biz, B-I-Z, bizcommunicationguy.com. Invite you to go there, see my services for corporations and business leaders, sign up for my newsletter and my phone call, phone number is on there. Be happy to hear from you and talk about how I can assist you. Again, Bob, uh, thank you for being with us. Any closing thoughts? Oh, listen, Bill, it's been a pleasure as usual. And all I can say is both of these books have had a significant impact on my life and the way I run my businesses. And I hope the same will be true for you. Thank you, Bob. And thanks to all of you. We'll be with you again next week with another guest.